Hi, and welcome back to Game Assist. My name is Daz, and my pronouns are they, them. The year is 2015. Your YouTube feed is filled with Let's Plays of a new anime-style dating simulator that features some extremely not safe for work scenes and an interesting Candy Crush-style game mechanic. Everyone is playing it and laughing at its cheesiness and crass humour. This game is, of course, none other than Honey Pop. I was 17 when Honey Pop was released, and I watched Markiplier's playthrough of the game for a number of reasons, including my interest in cute anime girls. I enjoyed the game, and later went on to watch his playthrough of Honey Cam Studio. Some parts of the game made me feel uncomfortable at the time, but I couldn't quite place why. Recently, I revisited Honey Pop to do some background research for another video that we're working on, and swiftly realised that it needed a video of its own. Before we begin, here are some warnings for your safety and comfort. This video contains discussion and, in some cases, depiction of racism, fetishism, alcoholism, misogyny, misogynoir, and sexual assault. Honey Pop is an extremely misogynistic and racist game. Let's discuss why. Let's set the scene. Honey Pop is a puzzle game slash dating simulator where you play as you, a human who is so terrible at picking up girls that a love fairy named Q takes it upon herself to save you from being perpetually single. Don't you recognize this adorable face? <laughs> it's Q from the bar! You see, as a love fairy, it's my job to help poor saps like you out with the ladies. It's just mm, what I do. Right from the get-go, the game is already shaming the player for their non-existent dating life and pushes its ideas about love and sex onto the player via Q's comments. This places Honey Pop firmly in the pickup artist genre of games, rather than the standard dating simulator genre, as success in the game revolves around picking up women. It is clear that the goal here is not just to go on some dates with some nice ladies, the goal is to fuck. Q's commentary throughout the game is problematic for a variety of reasons, which we'll cover more later but from the very beginning she is used to tell the player that this game, and dating in general, is about winning. She sees women as a conquest. Not the best message to send to your audience, especially when that audience is made up predominantly of 14 year old boys. Over the course of the game we are introduced to 12 women that are available for the player to date. These women represent a variety of stereotypical female character tropes from across the media, including anime. It has been suggested that this game was intended to be a satire, and that these two-dimensional portrayals of women were meant to be caricatures of the stereotypes, but the irony was definitely not clear in the gameplay or dialogue. Here's a quick rundown of the Honey Pop Girls, including those who you can only unlock by completing secret tasks. Tiffany is a 19-year-old college student, cheerleader, and babysitter. She embodies the girl-next-door stereotype, especially with her blonde hair and school uniform which served to emphasize her youth in a horrible, infantilizing way. Whoa, is this chick serious? That schoolgirl uniform is a little on the nose, don't you think? You meet fitness nut Kiana at the gym. She's a Mexican single mother who is also a part-time hairdresser. Aiko is one of Tiffany's teachers at college. She's a cynical Japanese alcoholic, and that's pretty much all we know about her. Belly is an Indian yoga instructor whom you also meet at the gym. She wears some kind of bastardization of traditional Indian dress, and much of her dialogue revolves around spirituality and modesty. In the bar, you meet Jessie, a confident cam girl and cougar who is also Tiffany's mother. Lola is a stewardess who loves tennis and wants to be a pilot. She's the only black character in the game, and this is handled very poorly, which we will come on to later. Nikki is working at the cafe when we meet her. She's 18, has blue hair and glasses, and is very much a manic pixie dream girl slash gamer girl type. Thank God. I was afraid you were another one of these FPS bros. Audrey is Nikki's friend and is described simply as the mega bitch. What a great term. That's basically her entire character, plus the fact she smokes weed and is a bit of a sundere. Sundere is a Japanese term for a character development process that depicts a person who is initially cold and sometimes even hostile, before gradually showing a warmer, friendlier side over time. Momo is one of the special characters unlocked by dropping a goldfish in the park. She is a straight-up cat girl looking for a home and a master. Pretty standard stuff. 
Celeste is the other unlockable character, a blue alien visiting Earth who isn't meant to date humans. Q herself becomes an attainable character once you have successfully taken one girl on the final date and had sex with them. Be ashamed to let these girls have you all to themselves. Yeah, you know what? Fuck it, I'm in. The final boss, so to speak, of Honey Pop is Venus. Yes, Venus, the literal goddess of love. Venus appears once you have had sex with every other character. If you are to ultimately prove yourself, there is one final challenge. <laughs> You're looking at her. She literally presents herself as the final challenge, once again enforcing the idea that dating women and having sex with them is a conquest. Once you've gotten the girl to have sex with you, you've won. Literally in this case. After looking back over these character summaries, I realised something. The ten main girls, excluding Q and Venus as they are technically vehicles for an extremely loose plot, each represent a different genre of porn. Tiffany is the girl next door or stepdaughter, Kiana is a Latina or yummy mummy, Aiko is Asian, Belly is modest or virginal, Jessie is a MILF or stepmum, Lola is ebony, Nikki is a gamer girlfriend or e-girl, Audrey is a Sundere, Momo is a cat girl, and Celeste is for all you alien or monster fuckers out there. So not only does Honey Pop portray women in an oversimplified and overgeneralized way, it conflates dating and sex, the reality, with porn, the fantasy. Teenagers getting their sex ed from porn is already enough of a problem without video games adding to the unrealistic expectations placed on them. So far, all of this is from our very first interactions within the game. I've barely scratched the surface, so let's get down to the nitty gritty. From looking at the character roster, Honey Pop appears to be a relatively diverse game. There are four women of colour and they're all from different backgrounds. However, the treatment of these women is truly horrendous. It's important to note here that diversity does not equal liberation, and you need both in order to successfully carry out social change. Having a diverse set of characters means nothing when you treat them like garbage. Earlier I mentioned Q's problematic commentary as the player's wingman. Her introductory comment about Aiko Yumi perfectly exemplifies how Honey Pop treats its women of colour. Dude. Bro. Asian chicks? Don't even get me started. I have like the worst case of yellow fever ever. Ever. Like a yellow plague. Before we really know anything about Aiko, she slotted into the Asian fetish box. That's the main thing that the game wants us to know about her. This is further emphasised by her unique gift. Honey Pop uses gifts as a way of upping your scores with the girls on your dates. There are several categories, and the unique category is exactly what it sounds like, a specific gift for a specific girl. Aiko's unique gift is a set of chopsticks. I wish I was joking. In one of the possible responses to receiving this gift, she calls the player out for being racist, but in the other two responses she seems genuinely hyped to receive a standard pair of chopsticks. How did you get your hands on this? Alcohol is also an important mechanic in Honey Pop. Similar to the gifts, it gives you bonus points during your dates and essentially makes it easier to get with the girls. So we can now add pressuring women to drink will make them want to sleep with you to the list of terrible messages that Honey Pop is sending its audience. This is especially harmful in Aiko's context, given the extreme drinking culture amongst Japanese workers. I don't believe that the developer was ignorant of this, as Aiko herself exhibits alcoholic tendencies. Cheers! That's it? I'm hardly drunk at all! That was a pussy drink! Hit me with something stronger! In a thread discussing the less talked about parts of Japanese culture, Twitter user at World of Extra stated that office superiors will force feed you alcohol until you black out. I've seen women get forced drunk and taken advantage of. Instead of trying to maybe tackle this issue through the medium of video games, Honey Pop instead just mirrors Japan's unhealthy drinking culture and presents it as acceptable. In reality, this culture results in violence against women that, due to virulent sexism in Japanese society, almost always goes unpunished. Lola, the only black character in the game, is also a victim of Q's racial fetishism. To clarify, racial fetishism is the act of regarding someone's race as an object and fixating on the use of this person as a sexual object. It is a form of racist othering and is often intertwined with misogyny. Mmm, mmm, I love me some chocolate. I'll have a tall glass of whatever she's serving. 
Know what I'm saying? Although racial fetishism can, and does, happen to any person of colour, black women are disproportionately affected by fetishism and over-sexualisation. According to our very own Sarah in the Building Anti-Racist LGBTQ Plus Spaces workshop, in relation to sexual fetishization specifically, black women's sexuality exists in a space where they are simultaneously treated as hypersexual beings and as fundamentally unattractive. This is especially the case for dark-skinned women. As well as being othered via racial fetishism, Lola is also marked as different within the game as she is the only black character, potentially casting her as exotic. It is also important to understand that, due to the complexity of misogynoir, black women can be fetishized by white women and black men, as well as white men. So Lola can be, and is, fetishized by a large portion of Honeypop's player base. McCulloch states that due to black women's predisposition to curvier body types, they are seen as being grown from a young age and are therefore somehow asking for it. This is important to note when looking at Lola's costume and body type. Sure, most of the women in Honeypop have large breasts, but they're not black, so the same fetishistic ideas do not apply to them. This hypersexualization of black women based on their rapid development is actually a product of the slave trade. Cassiana Boom summarizes their history as, in order for white men to justify their rape of enslaved black women, they spread the idea that black women were sexually insatiable. In this way, any instances of sexual assault were actually just giving them what they wanted. Misogynoir is an ongoing problem in our society that needs to be addressed within mainstream feminism if we are ever going to move past the idea of a hypersexual Jezebel black woman in our video games. So, this outfit is starting to get uncomfortable. Maybe you can help me out of it? Honeypop's racism is present in Belly and Kiana's character portrayals too. As an Indian woman, Belly is described as stereotypically submissive and modest, and not in a way that suggests any nuance and Kiana is another example of the unique gift being a racist stereotype. Who gives a sombrero to a Mexican woman? Once again, she reacts as if this was the coolest and most thoughtful gift anyone has ever given her. Oh, dude! Instead of attempting any representation of bilingualism, Kiana just occasionally says loco, and her large family and single mother status both reflect harmful stereotypes about Mexican familial relationships. For a game about loving women, Honeypop sure does hate women. There is a base level of respect for women as people missing from the core mechanics of this game. Sure, you can choose the slightly less creepy dialogue options when chatting to the girls, but there are some elements of the gameplay that are fundamentally built around disrespecting women. Take the fact-finding elements, for example. One of the ways to gain points with the girls is to find out facts about them and then correctly recall the answers later in the game. As a mechanic, I quite like this. However, it is immediately tainted by the use of bra size and weight as fun facts. When I first saw this dialogue option, I thought it was part of the creepy route and the girls would just tell you to fuck off for asking. But no, they seem more than happy to reveal their personal measurements to a complete stranger. You can also just straight up lie to the girls. In particular, Tiffany asks whether or not your relationship is exclusive. Not only is it impossible within the game's mechanics to respect her desire for monogamy, you're given the option to lie to her face about your other relationships. This blatantly disregards Tiffany's desires and emotions, and also shows no respect for her sexual health. STIs aren't a feature in the game, but if this situation were real, your failure to be open about your sexual activity could result in Tiffany, or any of the other girls for that matter, contracting an STI without realizing. Women's bodies are not just vehicles for sexual pleasure. I can't believe I have to say this in 2020, but yes, women are indeed people. Jessie represents a category of women that are constantly disregarded and disrespected both in the media and in real life, sex workers. Having dropped out of school at 16 due to her pregnancy, she became a porn star to support her daughter. Oh no, honey. I had to drop out of high school to care for my daughter. This backstory is extremely common in media portrayals of sex workers, as it is assumed that all sex workers do sex work as a last resort, and that they don't actually want to be doing it. I would recommend reading Revolting Prostitutes, The Fight for Sex Workers' Rights by Juno Mack and Molly Smith if you want to know more about sex work politics around the globe. Jessie's appearance also falls into stereotypical sex worker tropes. She wears a low-cut leopard print top, which according to Colette Shade, is a signal of poor taste and of trashiness, 
which really means that it represents the sexually available lower class woman. Author and burlesque dancer Joe Weldon says that for leopard print, there's an association with women who behave badly, usually sexually. She also mentioned in an interview for the Washington Post that leopard print became the uniform of the bad mum in the 60s. Peg Bundy in Married with Children and Mrs. Robinson in The Graduate are just two examples of this archetype making its way into the mainstream. We can now add Jessie May, promiscuous and alcoholic single mother in Honey Pop, to that list. Remember what I was saying earlier about the fetishization of black women? It turns out that some of the connotations of leopard print are also racialized. Leopard has a sexual or at least erotic connotation because it was linked to Africa, says Emily Regnier, a fashion photographer who documented people wearing leopard print in 2017. Leopard skin and fur has its own fashion history in Africa, with the print featuring on Shembi church vestments and sported on Congolese dictator Mobutu Sisi Seiko's cap when he met the queen. If a woman was wearing leopard, it means that she has a savage or wild sexuality. It's amazing how much misogyny can be drawn out purely from a character's appearance. As you may have noticed by now, Jessie is also a blonde. A blonde high school dropout, aka the perfect example of a dumb blonde. The trope is said to have originated with the character of Rosalie Dutte in the play La Curiosité de la Foi, who is established as both stupid and sexually available. In the Venn diagram of stereotypes, blondness is the overlap between stupidity, promiscuity, gold digging, and naked self-interest. This quote from Daniela Morosini perfectly encapsulates how the negative stereotyping of blonde women stems from various different types of misogyny rooted in men's insecurities about their intelligence, attractiveness, wealth, and power. Based on everything that I've talked about in this video, I was sceptical, to say the least, when my friend told me that a Honey Pop 2 was in development. The developer has expressed a specific desire to do better in this game, which is nice, but some of the information that has been released is already making me uneasy. There are two new characters that I want to touch on, Polly and Abia. As a trans person, Polly was the character that I was most interested in upon hearing about the new additions. This is because Polly is a trans woman. Sadly, my hopes were swiftly dashed after some initial research. Her entire personality is a misogynistic stereotype, reminiscent of 50s housewives or, more recently, trad wives. She's a very classy and traditional lady that dreams of someday being the perfect housewife. This plays into the harmful idea that trans women have to conform to the feminine ideal to be accepted as real women, allowing no room for the varieties of expression allowed to cis women. The other issue concerning Polly's character is her genitals. In the initial announcement for her character, it is revealed that Polly has not had bottom surgery and still has a penis. Also, she has a dick, so you better pack some extra lube and carry-on. You're gonna need it. This led to an outcry from fans requesting that they could still complete the game without having sexual encounter with Polly. Luckily, the developer did not go through with this, but has instead added in the option for you to date Polly with a vagina. This once again plays into harmful ideas about trans women and the idea that you have to fully transition to be a real woman, and to therefore be desirable. As many trans people will tell you, knowing when you have fully transitioned can be extremely difficult. The vagina does not make the woman. The disgust towards women with penises is not only prevalent among cis straight men, but also among many cis lesbians and cis bisexuals. I can already predict the number of players opting for post-op poly when playing, and it infuriates me. The developer has also removed the use of the word transgender from the game entirely, marking the two options for poly as female and female with male genitals. Not only does this reinforce the sex organ binary, which, by the way, is a myth, it panders to the Futanari fetish that in turn fetishizes trans women. The second new character that worried me upon her announcement was Abia. Abia is a hijabi woman of colour in a dating simulator that has previously exhibited rampant misogyny and racism. I think you can see why I was worried. There's not much information out there yet about her personality or interactions, but we do know that she works in airport security and that her nationality is… the Middle East. That is not a nationality! The developer couldn't be bothered to google an Arab country? and making her work in airport security seems like an extremely questionable decision given the suspicion and mistreatment that many Muslim people face when in airports. 
Something tells me her route isn't going to be a smart and nuanced depiction of Muslim womanhood and relationships to sex. So there you have it. Honey Pop is an extremely flawed game and I'm not quite sure how we all just ignored it when it was released. I know that at least for me it would have been due to a lack of proper education around sexism, racism and misogynoir. If anything, Honey Pop has provided us with a great example of what not to do when making a supposedly diverse dating simulator. Maybe take a look at what Dream Daddy did well and go from there. Speaking of Dream Daddy, why don't you check out Sarah's inquiry video all about it? They go into really great detail about all of the things that DDA DDS got right and the places where it could still be improved. We're huge fans of dating sims and visual novels at Game Assist, and I personally can't wait to play any upcoming games in the genre that showcase great representation. Thanks so much to everyone for watching. If you've enjoyed this video or learned anything, make sure to leave a like. Comment if you've got any thoughts or you'd just like to join me in my anger, and make sure to subscribe for more. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook at the links below. Thank you to our Patreon supporters who help to make videos like this possible. If you'd like to join them in supporting us, follow the link in the description. There are great perks from just $1 a month, including access to our lovely Discord community. I'd like to give a special shout out to our Game Assist ambassadors, Charlotte Turtle and Najib Hassan and our Tom Nook Sugar Daddy patrons, Ditsy Doggy and B. Your support means the world to us and we couldn't do this without you. I want to give a big thank you to those of you who have already subscribed. It means so much to us and we can't wait to show you what we're working on. This has been Daz from Game Assist. Thank you all for watching and until next time, take care.